Hey everyone, welcome to season two of Reversing Climate Change. We are doing that podcast thing now and launching a Patreon. You can find it at patreon.com slash Nori Podcasts. There are various tiers with different types of goodies available. Do you want to receive a special newsletter digest of what Nori Knots are reading that week? Be a part of a Nori book club? Get special access to Nori events? Go take a look at patreon.com slash Nori Podcast for what we're offering. And in that spirit of being lean in that startup kind of way that, you know, we like to do, this list of goodies is subject to change and we'd very much like your feedback. Is there something that you'd really like to see but it isn't listed here? Honest feedback does a lot to help us shape what we offer to you. You can send an email to podcast.nori.com or fill out our podcast survey anonymously in our newsletter, which you can find at nori.com slash subscribe. And thank you so much for listening to another season of Reversing Climate Change. Hello and welcome to the Reversing Climate Change podcast. I'm Ross Kenyon, rolling solo today. I have with me Nathaniel Rich, who's a novelist and author of Losing Earth, A Recent History. This book began as an August 2018 New York Times Magazine story called Losing Earth, The Decade We Almost Stopped Climate Change, and then was adapted and expanded into a book, which I really enjoyed. It's a great history of the early days of raising the climate alarm. And uh, it filled in a lot of gaps that I had. So thank you for writing that, Nathaniel. My pleasure. Appreciate it. Yeah, I guess, how would you say, what is the, the story broadly that you're trying to convey here? And where does it fit in into the narrative of climate change and people becoming aware of climate change? I know like LBJ knew about climate change when he was president, but it wasn't really mainstream or being discussed until some decades later. Is that true? Yeah, LBJ and, and really every every president since then has been briefed on the problem. The book tells the story of the what happened in mainly in Washington between 1979 and 1989. It's a it's a story that's been largely forgotten, and it's it's a story of of enormous you know triumph in which a few people, a handful of of people, a you know NASA scientist, a, a young environmental lobbyist, and young congressman, and and a few of their colleagues, staffers in the Senate and uh, the House, began to try to tell the world about what was happening, um, try to tell their own government what was happening in the American public, and managed over the you know the course of a decade with a number of setbacks along the way to bring the issue to the the world stage uh, and to what was then thought to be a solution, a global treaty to reduce uh, carbon emissions that would have been signed at the end of the 80s or the the beginning of the 90s. So the piece runs from 79, which is when there was scientific, it's it's essentially the date at which scientific consensus on the fundamental nature of, of climate change was articulated or, or crystallized. And it runs to 1989 when this agreement fell apart. Uh, and it's a narrative history. So it, it, it tells the stories from a, an intimate uh, vantage point of, of these several figures, Rafe Pomerantz, James Hansen, Al Gore, and, and, and a few others. And it explains you know, what happened during that period and, and how it, it changed their lives. And, and it, I, I think it's, a, it's an effort also to try to make sense of, of their failure. And one of the juicy hooks that I noticed that, that definitely caught my eye, and I imagine many readers as well, is that during this period, there really wasn't as much political conflict over climate change or global warming uh, as we see now, where there's fights, there's, there's divisions that seem intractable in many ways. But this used to be thought of as a sort of bipartisan, come together kind of issue. Uh, something that seems dreamlike to me at this t- time in uh, world history. It is, it, and it it is bizarre. It's it's like entering an alternate reality uh, in which the issue is not a partisan issue. It's not, as you said, it's not even politicized. There are Democrats and Republicans during this period in the highest levels of Washington and the U.S. government who pushed very forcefully for for major comprehensive solutions. And one of the hardest things, I think, one of the hardest tasks of writing this history was to convey to a reader living in you know, 2019 or 2020 how different the political landscape was. There was essentially a 
large faction of the Republican Party that then that no longer exists. And so, uh, you know, that 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 someone like George H.W. Bush even would come out and run uh, for for the presidency by using climate change as one of, you know, a major plank. Yeah, did he, uh, he called himself an environmentalist at some like United Auto Workers rally or something in Detroit, too. Yeah, he, he essentially strange, ran yeah. in current in current terms, you would say he ran to the left of Michael Dukakis on the environment in 1988. And so, you know, to understand that you have to understand this lost strain of, of American conservatism, which believed that protecting the natural world and natural resources was a conservative idea that there was nothing in fact more conservative than wanting to be a good steward of of the planet and you know this is a case that's laid out pretty eloquently uh, at the beginning of the decade by an officer within the the Reagan White House a conservative leader of the of the White House's own environmental policy group in a speech he gave to business leaders at the time you know, this is not to say that Republicans as a whole were great on environmental issues. They certainly weren't. And Reagan himself was a was a total disaster um, in a very, you know, sort of Trumpian manner, uh, you know, taking office and nominating to run each agency, you know, the worst of the worst <laughs> industry hack that he could come up with. And so there was still a left right mm-hmm. divide on environmental issues, but on climate change, particularly you didn't see the same divide. And in fact, you saw a major bipartisan push towards the end of the decade to try to uh, develop real solutions. This is an obvious follow-up question, but why? And and what changed? How did we get from there to here? And I guess maybe it's more similar than I think in the way that you framed it, because there are people who are right of center. We've had a number of them on this podcast before who are working on this, like Benji Backer from American Conservation Coalition, which is a, a conservative conservation, what a tongue twister that is, organization, and Bob Inglis uh, from Republican. And there's other organizations too, I'm sure I don't even know about that are germinating who recognize that there's a there's a gap in the market here where this old strain of conservatism still wants to value this. And and they aren't being represented in the Trump White House or the Republican mainstream to the degree that they might like. So is it is it that similar? Is it a similar level that uh, I'm comparing it to? Or was there really some sort of sea change between uh, now and then? I guess some of both, really. I I think there was a sea change by the end of the decade. And and Losing Earth goes into detail about how that happened. And the short version of it is that there were a couple policy decisions made at the highest levels of the oil and gas industry at at the American Petroleum Institute and within Exxon, the biggest oil and gas company um, then and I guess now, to fight against any kind of uh, meaningful policy to reduce carbon emissions. And and what we've seen since then is this in- enormous lobbying effort uh, paired with a disinformation campaign, you know, funded by hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars uh, to sow doubt, convince the American public that the science is uncertain, uh, to buy off politicians, and, and, and particularly to turn the Republican Party into a party of climate denialism. Uh, and, you know, uh, a position that has ha- has has uh, sustained even as the oil and gas industry in its own public comments at least pretends to be interested in in climate change and reducing emissions of course you know their actions don't support that but even they understand publicly it's it's not tenable to pretend that this thing isn't happening but you still have the republican party having uh, taken on the issue as a as a bedrock partisan issue so it's you know, the short version is the industry got involved. Now, there are people, as you say, who are center or right of center today who may share those values, but they're not really welcomed in in this party. Uh, certainly, their positions are not. And, you know, then I guess it's on their conscience to how, how they vote and how they, you know, prioritize environmental issues or, you know, these issues confronting the future of our civilization versus other things like, you know, abortion or immigration or tax law and all the rest. So I think there are there are plenty of Americans who might still occupy that, you know, that that area on the Venn diagram of conservative beliefs and environmental, some sense of environmental stewardship. But you don't see it reflected, on, certainly not in the national party. No, it isn't super common. 
So it sounds like the narrative that you're bringing here, and this is after the period in which you cover in your book terminates, but after your book, you're saying that there is a very strong coordinated effort by oil and gas and and fossil fuel companies to discredit climate science. And this is, I recently read Michael Mann's uh, The Madhouse Effect, or some of what you're saying, I haven't read this, but I know this is broadly the thesis of Merchants of Doubt, that the strategy of industry uh, lobbyists and tastemakers is to cast doubt on, on the fundamentals in the same way that tobacco companies cast doubt on whether or not tobacco use is actually dangerous. And I've always wondered to what degree that story is nearly as nefarious as it's presented. Is that a form of activism or is that actually what did happen? Is there anything that is available to complicate that story that you think, or is that just broadly correct? It's broadly correct. I mean, it's not, it's not a theory. I mean, I think it's, there's, there's a huge amount of evidence to support those claims or those conclusions. You know, as I, learned in my research. Uh, I spoke with some of the people who were responsible for first formulating uh, policy, uh, industry policy response to proposed climate legislation. So, uh, you know, to take a step back, by 1988, as the issue enters this public consciousness in a dramatic way after James Hansen testifies before Congress and and his famous, now famous testimony where he said, it's time to stop waffling. Uh, global warming is here. It's already present. It's not a theory anymore. You have uh, 32 bills introduced in Congress, including uh, some bipartisan omnibus bills that are more ambitious and far-reaching than even what is now being proposed as the Green New Deal. So you have an enormous amount of, of energy there. You have George H.W. Bush running on the issue. You have the head of Bush's EPA, Bill Riley calling for a massive uh, from American leadership and this major global treaty and all the rest. The oil and gas industry for the first time has to figure out what its stance is going to be. The industry has been following the science for decades. That's also heavily documented, not just by me, but by you know, many others. And but now for the first time, there has to they decide. You know, we need to have a, a united front about what you know what what kind of action we should take. Uh, in the face of all this proposed legislation, and they decide at the beginning, uh, they agree upon several points. One is that they need to be part of the policy conversation. You know, big surprise. They they want to be in the in the room um, where these things are being negotiated. They want to make sure that where there is doubt in the science, uh, that they emphasize those those areas of uncertainty. Now that that should be dis- understood as, as a distinction from where they would later get, you know, some years later where they would try to cast out on the whole fundamental science of climate change. Here they're saying, you know, where there's some doubt about future projections, we should emphasize those, those, those bits of un- uncertainty. Uh, that's the beginning of that. And we will refuse to endorse any legislation that affects our bottom line, also very significant uh, when you start to understand what kind of legislation is being proposed, these very far-reaching efforts to curb uh, emissions. So that's the beginning of it. And I would say, you know, in its first iteration, it's not nearly as sinister as it would get. In, In fact, it's more in line with this standard practices of the industry, which are themselves, I think, morally questionable, but are essentially to try to fight fight off any kind of regulation. So that's bad enough, but I think where it, it, it gets to pretty quickly, and and it gets there quickly in, in, in part because they, they're have so successful right away at sowing doubt in the in the public in the culture that they soon they soon push it further and further till they're they're actually saying that, you know, the world's not getting warmer, or they're saying that carbon dioxide doesn't cause atmospheric warming and and all the rest. So I think that's as nefarious as you get. I mean, I you know, I, so I think I think the those who find those actions villainous are are completely, you know, supported by the facts. Uh, this is these are companies that um, are trying to maximize profits while knowing that doing so will bring about tremendous destruction, injury, death, you know, and all the effects of of warming, and of course, in the long term, put our entire civilization at risk. So I think it's, you know, there's no way to understate 
their role in this. And, and yes, it, the, the playbook is connected because you have the same firms that are uh, being used, the same PR firms that are being used to in some of these early PR campaigns. So it's, it's, it's all part of the same universe. And that's, that's what Naomi Oreskes wrote about in, in Merchants of Doubt, that this is a corporate campaign. But you see it taken to this incredible level in, with climate change in particular. They, they're able to push this, this disinformation as far as, 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 in any, as they have been able to with any other kind of health threat or environmental threat. And, and yeah, tobacco, smoking is, you know, is probably the closest analogy, um, you know, because they got to a point where they're saying smoking was healthy for you when they knew. Yeah, telling mothers that to get to a healthy birth weight, a certain brand of cigarette will help, stuff like that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. That's interesting to know. And this goes beyond the the bounds of this book and your scope, but if you want to speculate wildly, do you think there will be uh, legal ramifications for fossil fuel companies in the future? Should we expect something similar to what happened with tobacco companies? Yeah, it's already happening. There, there's there are a number of of legal campaigns uh, to to try to hold these companies responsible. Also, one to that seems to be failing now to hold the U.S. government responsible. Uh, this suit called uh, Juliana versus the United States, which was brought by twenty one youth uh, plaintiffs, I should say, including James Hansen's granddaughter, that recently suffered a setback in an appeals court but is attempting to hold the U.S. responsible, the, the federal government, for failing to take action and, in fact, making the problem, you know, climate problem worse while knowing full well the repercussions of its, of its policy. But a lot of these, these lawsuits, uh, you know, they're major ones against Exxon, and they're, they're weaving through the courts now, and whether any of them will be, ultimately will be an effective remedy, I think remains in doubt. Uh, you know, I could imagine under a different administration, some kind of uh, more directed effort to try to hold accountable these, these companies. But it's all, you know, and, and I imagine in the future, as the devastation you know, mounts, there will be some kind of popular movement or a broader popular movement than there already is to penalize these companies for the, these actions. But I doubt whether those penalties, even if realized, will be sufficient to undo or even check some of the, the damage they've, they've achieved. This is another highly speculative question, and it fits broadly with what I understand. Your point is why there was failure to act on this information, even though there was broad consensus, which is just why. I mean, the people who work at oil companies live on the same planet. Their children will have to face the same consequences as everyone else's. Or even they themselves, if they're young enough, will live through the the nastiest bits of this too. So why is it? Is it just? Do they expect to? <laughs> I don't know. Have some gated enclave where they can live that is uh, uh, separate from the consequences of these actions? I, I don't fully understand that part of the story, or, or how they might justify it if if it really is nearly as mendacious as as uh, you believe the evidence supports. Which I don't know enough about to say one way or the other. Yeah, I think. That's a moral question that that I've certainly thought a lot about. I, I think I think your premise is I would adjust your premise, I suppose, which is to say that they will be as affected as everyone else. In the short or even medium term, they won't. You know, wealthy people and, and people in the wealthiest countries of of the world uh, will not be as greatly harmed as poor people. Uh, you know, people in marginalized communities, people of color. Climate change cuts, exacerbates every form of inequality just about that we have in society. So poor people suffer, will, will, will suffer more from, from the effects of, of warming. You know, it, immigration will spike. Uh, you'll have greater geopolitical conflict between states that, that are suffering natural disasters or, or resource scarcity. So yes, everybody will be affected in some way, but you know, perhaps the the CEO of Exxon and, and his heirs, you know, they won't feel it the same way that a poor person living, you know, I was going to say Bangladesh, but even, you know, somebody living in, in Norfolk or, you know, somewhere will feel it. However, you're right in, to say that in the long term, of course, there's, these are civilizational threats. So we're all at risk. And so then it gets into these other questions about Larger questions, which I, 
very much the questions that I wanted to try to explore in Losing Earth, which is, you know, how do we really make sense of long-term threats? How do we think about the future? How do we value the future, particularly the distant future, uh, in relation to the present or the short, short term? And I think we have, we do have real limitations uh, as a species, certainly as a, as a democracy, you know, in which no elected official uh, is in office uh, as a term that lasts longer than six years. Uh, you know, we have real limitations here in how the systems we have in place, our government, our economy, deal with these kinds of risks. And that's not to say that we can't overcome those limitations, but I think one of the lessons uh, of the period that I wrote about when, as you said, there wasn't really any ant antagonistic force to be reckoned with. The industry was not trying to stop progress. It was, it was sort of sitting on the sidelines, you know, following along during most of the decade. Then, you know, it does, it does force one to realize that how difficult it is to even act on a problem of this scale when we, when everybody basically agrees on the basic, you know, facts of the case. Um, and so that's, that's a tricky part of part of it, and that that certainly opens up more questions than it answers. <laughs> but th those are the kinds of ideas I was trying to to wrestle with in in the book. Indeed, and I liked that focus. Though you also received criticism as a result of that conclusion or that wrinkle that you've added. In particular, I was uh, reading Naomi Klein's latest book, On Fire: The Case for a New Green Deal. And it was a piece that originally appeared in The Intercept called Capitalism Killed Our Climate Momentum, Not Human Nature, uh, human nature in uh, scare quotes there. Yeah. So she uh, took aim at your piece, uh, the magazine article, not the book, which came later for what I perceived as the focus on how during this time period, primarily in the 80s, uh, there was an industry pushback to the same extent that would emerge. And there was bipartisan support for climate action, and yet it failed to happen. And she wanted to place the blame at the feet of neoliberalism. And you have, you know, this is the era of Thatcher and Reagan. And this is what corrupted it. Oh, and also globalization. So globalization is, is starting to take off. And then especially by the end of the decade is really in beginning in full swing here and getting going. So who's right, Nathaniel, basically? Was there anything to her criticism that you thought was uh, spot on where you took it on the chin and were just like, all right, that's a very good point. I'll, I'll amend this. Or did you think uh, it missed something? It's a, weird, it's a weird argument because I wrote about the Reagan White House. I wrote about well, Thatcher, you know, who, who called for a global treaty on climate, the former chemist. You know, I was writing about power in Washington, industry, government. So yes, you can call that neoliberalism. You can talk about, you can, you can use these sort of large academic buzzwords, but if you don't attach them to anything specific, it's harder for me to engage it. I mean, you could easily just have read my piece and said, look, this shows you how neoliberalism fails to ad address these problems. So, you know, that's what I didn't, uh, so I was, I was more confused than anything else. I mean, I think Line has a very specific you know, point that she likes that she makes over and over again, and she was using this history to make you know to put it in in her terms, which you know she's welcome to do. But I you know there was nothing in her in her piece that that either that she substantiated with facts or that that overturned anything in my in my piece. Um, she was just using different buzzwords, so you know, it didn't, it felt sort of neither here nor there to me. Um, there's nothing she, she wrote about that I didn't include. And there's nothing that I wrote about that couldn't have been used to make her argument just as well. I, I think those are very good, good caveats that you bring with Thatcher being a chemist in her private life and supporting a global treaty on climate change. But then also uh, George H.W. Bush uh, coming out and being an environmentalist also in the Republican Party and doing these things it doesn't fit as neatly with like, I, I like Naomi Klein's work. I, I read basically all of it or I've read most of it. And um, one thing I noticed is, that is there is a very strong Manichaean trend to it. There's always like a, a, a good versus evil kind of vibe. And I, I don't always feel like there is a lot of nuance in a lot of places that I, I have to get elsewhere. If I want stories like that, for instance, I don't know if I've ever seen any market actor in any of her work be portrayed as someone who could be conceived as good. 
and surely there are, are, are some, just like not everyone who supports government or, or nonprofit or cooperatives doing something. Not all of those people are good people with good results and uh, good intentions either. It's a mix. Like most things in life, uh, there's, there's a nice mix of, of the moral characters involved. And I think it's, it's good to recognize that. I think your writing does a very good job of that. But it also makes your story harder to tell. It's I feel smarter for having read it, but it also didn't reinforce some super clear, you know, something that I could write on a picket sign and say, Nathaniel Rich told me this, and this is what we have to do now. And I think that's an important distinction to make because Naomi Klein does a very different form kind of writing than I do. She, she writes activist, she does activist writing. She writes pieces intended to convey a very straightforward message you know, in this case, that capitalism um, cannot solve the climate crisis. And she writes with the intention of delivering also a very specific outcome, or uh, she writes to motivate her readers to act in very specific ways. Um, in this case, you know, I suppose to vote for a Green New Deal is her, is her new book, or support candidates that do, and that's fine. Uh, and, you know, I support those candidates as well, but that's not the kind of writing that I that, that that interests me as a writer. I, I like to write about stories that don't have such clear agendas or, or, or that at least have some sense of moral tension or com- complexity. And, and I felt that the story from 1989 to the present with climate change, which is essentially the story of the oil and gas industry getting involved and, and Republicans uh, becoming the party of climate denialism, uh, had been told well. And it was also, frankly, Kind of straightforward and easy story to tell. It's it's a really stark case of of heroes and villains. The story before that interested me as a writer because it wasn't so clear, as you said, to to, to figure out heroes and villains. That that it wasn't there wasn't some evil force that was trying to stop progress during this time. In fact, a lot of people with good intentions worked really hard on the problem and still failed. Uh, and I think in part because of, of limitations that were in, intrinsic in them and, and frankly, to some extent, in our species and our system of, of government. Again, as I said, it's not doesn't mean we can't overcome those limitations, but I think that the tragedy of this of the story, and it really is a tragedy, is that there were flaws in the way that these heroic figures went about trying to solve this critical problem and that the flaws emerge from their own actions. And that's what makes it tragic. It also is what makes the story dramatic. And I think, you know, from a narrative standpoint, it's a lot more dramatic than what happened afterwards, which is just this, this, this story of this cruel corporate force trying to stop any kind of meaningful policy. Um, I think both stories need to be told, but you know, as it relates to Naomi Klein, she wants to tell the story from 1989 to the present. And, and, you know, I think she's welcome to do it. I wanted to talk about a, a story that is a, a little bit, as you said, uh, resists interpretation, or at least resists clear moralizing as well. And, and also, frankly, it's a story that I think holds a lot of lessons for where we are now and where, and where we're headed. And one of the reasons why I liked your book and article so much is because I think for most people, they became aware of climate change, either as individuals who are living at the time, or just if they're thinking back in their historical understanding of it is uh, Jim Hansen's uh, testimony. That's sort of like the the beginning, right? I think for most right. people. Yeah. And so the story that you're, you're basically doing a prequel, it's sort of like a climate change prequel. Is that is that a <laughs> halfway decent? Yeah, I think that's so, right. I mean, yeah. I think I think that's exactly... That's 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 correct. I mean that the the story, at least as it's known in the public, is yes, begins with James Hansen telling Congress, you know, we need to do something, and and then you have this emergence of this the Death Star of, of American Petroleum Institute and the industry. <laughs> you had to take it just one step further than me, huh? <laughs> <laughs> right. And I mean, of course, Hansen testified before Congress just about every year for the preceding ten years um, before that famous testimony, and he'd said just about the same thing each time. Uh, and and no, but it is it is pervasive that 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 narrative and and even the idea that this is a new problem. I mean, I think of Alexandria Ocasio Cortez on the floor of the House uh, some months ago, making this very eloquent speech, demanding you know Green New Deal and and that the federal government take responsibility and so on. And she punctuated this this appeal by saying the government 
or Exxon has known about this since 1989, the year I was born. And she said before, you know, the government's known about this since 1989. And of course, I want to say, well, the government's known about it since 1957, uh, at least. Exxon's known about it since the, the same time, you know, the 50s as well. So, you know, the industry has been so successful, I think, with propagating this idea that it's a new problem that even people like Ocasio-Cortez who are on the forefront of, of you know, the policy still buy into the idea that this is a new crisis uh, when that could not be you know, farther from, from the truth. So I think there is something valuable about understanding how we got to that point, you know, how we got to the, do a place where the, the way I see the story is that as of 1989, essentially the story stops, that we've been in a paralysis, political paralysis, and to some extent, a kind of cultural paralysis when it comes to climate since then. So, so I wanted to know how did we get to that paralysis? How did, how, why did things come to stop? You know, why did the, the needle drop then? Uh, and, and how could it have been different? Or what, what, was there any hope for any, any different outcome? Well, you dangled this in front of me, and then we went a different direction with this last question. But so what do we do? What, what is the, the historical lesson that we should pull from the time period that you were writing about? Uh, is there any, any sort of good lessons that we can apply onto our current uh, zeitgeist? Yeah, I think the major, there's a major political lesson to be, to be learned, which is that, that there are limits to what I would call an appeal to reason. That essentially, it's the argument that activists, beginning with Rafe Pomerantz in, in, in my story in 1979, have been making uh, for now for 40 years, which is to say, we need to act on climate change because we have the science, we know what to do, we understand that if we fail to act now, things will get much worse uh, very soon, and the longer we wait to act, the worse things will get. Now, every, everything about that appeal is, is accurate, but it's not enough. It's clearly not enough to motivate people to act. It was not enough during the 80s when you didn't have political opposition, and it's certainly not enough today. And yet that really has been the activist line since 1979, all the way up until, you know, through Al Gore, through Inconvenient Truth, all the way up until about a year ago, when you have the emergence of this new wave of activists led by Ocasio-Cortez and, and Greta Thunberg and, you know, Extinction Rebellion, Sunrise, Sunrise Movement in the U.S., that the, uh, the idea being with this new activists, activism being that um, it's not simply a logical issue, that it's, it's a moral issue, that, that, our, that if we fail to act, we undermine just about every value that we hold dear, that we uh, use as the bedrock for our our society, you know, it, it, questions of equality and, and fairness and fraternity, uh, egalitarianism, that, that all of these begin to crumble uh, if we fail to take action on this problem, because this problem, of course, will exacerbate every form of inequality that we have. And so that, that's a different line of argument. Uh, I think it's, it's, you know, it tends to be expressed more emotionally and more personally. You have activists no longer saying things like, you know, it's, it's foolish not to act. They say, your inaction is killing us, uh, or, you know, I'm afraid to have children. Um, you know, it's time to panic, all of the rest. I think it's, it's a more emotional language, but it's also a more honest language and it's a more personal language. And so I think the lesson of this period has been absorbed in that, and you see it in that form of activism. And that, that to me is the most profound shift that we've had in the last 40 years, uh, that, that people are speaking about it in this different, different register. And that might not seem like a lot that, you know, people are using different words, but I happen to think that it's enormously powerful to put this into a moral context. And I, and I, and I do feel that whenever we have had moments of, of profound transformation in our society, particularly around social issues, uh, that they've always been accompanied by moral urgency. And we haven't seen that with climate publicly, at least writ large, until, until now. And I think that's, that's an exciting development, you know, how, how far, how quickly it will, you know, motivate people to change their minds and, and motivate people to vote differently. We'll see, but I think already it has had a quite dramatic effect uh, 
on the way the American public understands the issue. You see it in polls and you see it in, in um, you know, how people are voting in the Democratic primary. Okay. So if you have a, a set of scales out here and on the positive side, you have this change in rhetoric and increased awareness and the, these, the moral case uh, against the change in climate is becoming weightier in people's minds and that's acting. And then on the other side, you have at least from what we've talked about and also the books that we've mentioned, concerted disinformation campaigns played a large role in climate inaction. Um, has that negative side of the scale with this disinformation, has that also been lessening or changing? I feel like I've noticed that people that I know who used to be deniers that the climate change was happening are now more like lukewarmists or they think adaptation will be will be easier than expected and stuff like that. So I, I at least anecdotally, I've noticed stuff like that. Do you think that's also changing at the you know higher echelons of that too? It is. I think I think the pressure and I, and I really think that you know there's a moral pressure that has has a role in this. I don't know that it's decisive, but I do think at a certain point it becomes laughable. It, it becomes ridiculous to pretend this isn't happening in the same way that even the most evangelical to you know, right wing religious politician would still not pretend would not say in public that the earth is only six thousand years old uh, or what, whatever. Uh, so I, I do think that it's it is shifting, and you see that reflected in some of these new bills that are now being discussed on the right or center right, I guess, ideas to plant trees, for instance, um, and some, you know, that, that I would put in the same kind of realm of, or, or you know, or, or adaptation, certainly, um, which is, yes, on the spectrum is not as extreme. I don't, not necessarily useful um, or helpful, but, but certainly reflects a, a shifting of the sands. And, um, you know, I think even Trump said, after all of his denialist rhetoric, I think he recently said, well, of course, you know, I think it's, it's happening, but whatever. And so, you know, I think it, it, there will become a time where it's, it's, it's no longer just socially acceptable, even on the far right to pretend that this isn't happening, uh, certainly not morally acceptable. And I think you do see that filtering down. And I think there is a transition that's happening, but you know, as with everything with climate change, it's a question of how, how quickly and, and furthermore, it's not enough for everybody in the country to believe in the science. You know, that's, that's where we were in 1988. Right. And we still didn't get very much done. What was missing is that it wasn't the top priority. Uh, and what the kind of transformation we're talking about, the amount of money that we need to put into renewable energy, you know, carbon re removal, and transitioning away from fossil fuels, even if it's economically advantageous, it's, it's still a profound shift that has to take place in, in our society. And, and that will not happen unless there's enormous political popular pressure on, on our elected officials to, to do it. So that's, that's where we need to get to. And we're still quite a, quite a ways from there, but it, but there is a shift on happening now. I think it's, it's, um, I think it's quite obvious. I think so. And I think it's primarily, this is just me spitballing here. I have no evidence for this, but from where I sit, it appears that a lot of the climate action proposed by uh, conservatives and libertarians are a response to uh, the Green New Deal, which is terrifying to them. Um, they don't want to radically recreate the entire world to, to do this. They, they want to make sure it's something that works. They don't think a lot of these government programs will work in the way as intended. They want to make sure it's done in a sensible way. Whereas I think previously, I think solution aversion was in play for a lot of them too, which is that they don't see any solutions that would uh, appeal to them as people who enjoy markets and they don't think that they would work anyways. So why not just like dig a def defense in depth and just deny that the problem is even a problem in the first place. But I think they're realizing now that the defenses have been breached and it's time to like move back to the trenches uh, farther back. Sorry, I just watched 1917. So that's what's happening, Nathaniel. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it works. I think you inevitably get to a point with climate change and climate policy where you, you succumb to the military metaphors because that's what we're up against or uh, mobilization that can of society that can only really be compared to a, a global war yeah it's always the i hear marshall plan i uh, multiple times a week at this point so i'm i'm wondering what other metaphors people are going to bring in there i think I, I did the first yeah. world war one one that i've heard slight departure yeah 
uh indeed what are you working on now you have anything else coming out another novel i guess you've written a few of those but you are also writing on climate change what a interesting career that you've had thanks um yeah another novel and also a a book of of pieces about not not exclusively or specifically climate change but stories that chart our changing relationship to the natural world which of course is no longer natural by any definition now that we've you know there's not a single square inch of 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 earth on the planet that we haven't influenced uh, through our activities in some way and so it's about you know how we got to this this point to some extent this eerie new place that we find ourselves and and the even more uncanny future that we are entering and trying to reconcile some of our old traditional cultural views of of nature with this very unnatural place that we're that we're headed. I would love to read this. I can't wait. Where could someone keep up with your work if they want to know when something new comes out? If you are running your mouth on Twitter, where might they keep up with you there? <laughs> yeah, I try I try not to run my mouth on Twitter as much as possible, but I'm at Nathaniel Rich and, and my website's uh NathanielRich.com and and I'm yeah, I'm around. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Listeners, I would definitely recommend reading. And there's also a very nice audiobook version of Losing Earth, A Recent History. I really like it. It's an undertold part of the story. It's very detailed and well told. And thank you so much for being here, Nathaniel. Thanks so much for having me on. I enjoyed speaking with you. Well, thank you so much for listening. If you like the show, please rate and review it in Apple Podcasts and or Stitcher. It really helps us a lot to get this content to a wider audience. If you think what we're doing is useful, interesting, fun, hopefully all three, we'd certainly appreciate your rating and review. You can keep up with Nori at Nori.com where there is a newsletter. That's Nori.com slash subscribe. There's podcast. There's a whole bunch else. Or you can send us an email at podcast at Nori.com. We are also now on Patreon at patreon.com slash Nori Podcasts if you'd like more content, engagement, and community. And thank you so much for your support.